morning and welcome to Travis Baptist this morning. It's good to see the pews filling up once again. Maybe by the end of the year we'll be at, at, at uh, our normal capacity and that would be great. Especially if we continue having folks online watching throughout the country and actually I think probably throughout the world. So if you haven't shared, you know, if you're on Facebook and you haven't shared, you know, the, the, uh, the messages, you know, that, that's a good re- way to reach one other person too. You know, uh, pastor posts the, uh, the message on uh, Sunday afternoon and also uh, Wednesdays. Uh, the Bible study that he's been doing on Wednesdays, that's also posted. So, good avenue to, uh, to, to help reaching those who wouldn't normally go to church, but they'll, they'll be willing to look on, online and maybe after a while they'll grace somebody's door. So, but we're here to worship the Lord. So, let's go ahead and stand as we sing Sanctuary. Sanctuary, pure and holy, tried and true, with thanksgiving I'll be a living sanctuary for you. Lord, prepare me to be a sanctuary. Today's scripture reading is from Job 1, 6 through 12. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present, them, present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him? around his household, and around all that he has on every side. You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you and your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand. Let's pray together. We love you, Lord. And we hope, Father, we begin to understand and to worship your ways. Sometimes it's so confusing as we go through what we go through, as we struggle with what battles against us, as it seems that there are forces far beyond our reckoning guiding these things. And Lord, We know at the top of all of that is you. And we're going to trust you. And we're going to love you. And we're going to pray to you. And we're going to ask you, Lord, to help us. We're praying, Lord, as we submit to your will, that you begin to ease the burdens of the virus, to ease the burdens of the economic pressures many families are feeling, that you would help us get through this semester in school, that you would help us, Lord, uh, become the church you want us to be, Help us, Lord, to begin opening doors again and reaching out and and touching people's lives with your message. 
We're praying today, Lord, because so many are struggling, so many are anxious, and so many are, are despairing. And so we ask you, God, heal our land. Reach down to those who are trying to lead us, Lord, and, and let them humble themselves under your will. God, we're praying that at every level of government, at every level of society, that your spirit is blowing a fresh wind, that your spirit is coming into people's homes and into people's hearts and convicting them of the fact that they need Jesus Christ. That from Corpus Christi up to Washington, D.C., hearts are being changed and those who have responsibilities are beginning to understand that they must give an account to you. Lord, that their hearts might change, that they might act mercifully and properly and do that which is right in your eyes. Now, Lord, we're praying for this and we're hoping soon that you will come and set your kingdom up so that everything will be as it ought to be. We pray for these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you, and you can be seated. We are glad you're worshiping with us this morning. Um, happy birthday, Travis Baptist Church. You're 111, 110 years old. Um, <laughs> remember, that was 10 years ago when we, yeah. Um, back in 2011, we recognized the 100th anniversary of the church, and somewhere along the way, the formation of the church was officialized on uh, at the end of January of 1911. So there you go. Um, but uh, let us remember, even as, as trying as these times are, to keep moving forward with, with what God is doing. We are at the end of January, as I said. We got one month down, just 11 more of these to go. Um, and uh, that means uh, out there in the foyer, in the mailboxes, the big brown thing with all the little boxes, your offering statements are in there. You need those, and uh, we are required to get them to you, so there they are. Um, they're arranged by first letter of your last name, so please make sure you check over those and um, uh, get them for your records. Um, coming up this week, we've got uh, on Thursday, we've got Awana uh, at 6.20 p.m., and uh, next Sunday is going to be the Lord's Supper, our first one of 2021. So please be in preparing your hearts for that. Um, Vacation Bible School is just around the corner. Yes, we're having it July 19th to 23rd. Our next meeting will be February 22nd here in the sanctuary. So please be praying for that and also asking God how he would like uh, you to help serve in that. Um, not this Thursday, but the next Thursday. We're going to start uh, the, the midweek prayer meeting back up. It will be meeting in here, not down in the B room, but in here on Thursdays. We're doing it on Thursdays because we're already having a one on Thursday. So um, 6.30 p.m. Uh, on the 11th of February. That's a week from Thursday. Uh, we'll be in here and we'll be starting back with the prayer list with the prayer meeting and, and that. The There'll be a brief devotional, but there won't be a full-on Bible study. We post that, uh, as was mentioned, uh, on Wednesday afternoons, okay? So keeping those things in mind. Um, also, uh, we have talked to the people doing the shoebox ministry, the shoe ministry, not the shoe boxes, the shoes themselves, first blessings. And we are getting set up to do that again August 14th. Uh, this summer. So uh, we want you to be in prayer about that. Uh, pretty soon we're going to have to start asking for our offerings because we do have to contribute to that. And uh, we're looking for hopefully 150 kids. Um, and uh, so we want to be in prayer for that. We will be asking for your help in the coming months. So please, August 14th, that's a Saturday. Um, and uh, keep that date set aside for us. Okay. We would appreciate that. If you're with us for the first time or the first time in a long time, we got a flap on the bulletin cover. If you wouldn't mind filling that out, tears off, you drop it in the offering plate and we'll try and get a gift bag to you. Also, um, if you simply need to update your information with us for uh, phone numbers, emails, addresses, anything like that, or even a prayer request, there's a space on that little form to do so. And so we want to take a few moments now to welcome you into the Lord's house.
as we make it back to our places, we will continue to stand. But it was kind of nice hearing that, that hustle and bustle and the mumbling and it, it seems like there's more today than there's been in, in quite a while and it's, it, it's actually kind of refreshing to, to know that the pews are beginning to fill back up even though we gotta you know keep the mask on and do as best social distancing as we can uh, things are, are kind of beginning to get back to normal Let's continue with singing, uh, Blessed Be Your Name. I may be kind of all over on this one, so just, if you know it, sing out, and let's uh, go through it. <laughs> Blessed Be Your Name. That was the first time I actually went through it without stumbling all over myself. <laughs> but blessed be the name. Thou art worthy. Oh, before that, uh, the children may be excused to head on up the children's church. 
I almost forgot. Good thing you had that. <laughs> I normally write it down on my notes. <laughs> As they're heading out, well, the rest of us will sing, Thou Art Worthy. want to take a few moments to pray. This is the time when we have our family prayer time where the altar up here is open. If you wish to come up here and pray, uh, there will be one of the deacons up here to pray with you if you want someone to pray with you. Um, but we need, as we open our eyes up to the world around us, to the city around us, we need to be lifting up our Lord. We need to lift our hearts. We need to confess our sins. We need to be seeking Him every step of the way. All that you're going through, all that you're struggling with. Every single one of us. To pray for ourselves, to pray for our church, for our neighbors, for the leadership in our government. Praying for all the turmoil that's going on around us. We need to be in prayer. Again, if my people called by my name is who that invitation is extended to. God's people, humbling themselves, praying, seeking His face, and don't forget, turning from their wicked ways. God's going to he hear from heaven. So let's come before Him with whatever is weighing you down, whatever is tearing you apart, whatever is getting your blood pressure up, and cast it all before His feet. Let's bow our heads.
Our Lord and our God, we come before you humbled, Lord, and broken, worried, anxious about the future, about the direction certain things are taking in our lives. We know that our sin is laid before you. We know that our failures as your people, our disobedience, our anger, the secrets we hold inside, the things we refuse to surrender to you, Lord, and all these things, we confess them and ask for your forgiveness. We fail you so often. We complain about others and yet fail to rectify our own ways. So God, as your people, we come before you this morning, Lord, asking you to cleanse our hearts, to give us new attitudes, new hopes, new desires that we would turn from what has been dragging us down and instead embrace you and your ways alone. And Lord, we pray for the leadership of this country, of this state, of this county, of this city, that you, Lord, would reach down into their hearts and humble them to where they will seek you also. We can't judge their hearts, but we can know, Lord, that When they lead us in ways that are not in accordance with your word, it it troubles us. In fact, it's going to bring us down. And so we're praying for repentant hearts in our leadership. We're praying that your ways and your will will guide them. We're praying that from the president down to the mayor, to the city council, to each one of us, our hearts will be broken for you. And that we will find the only way for healing is to love you and to follow you. So God, we're praying for us. Praying for us as a church that our light would burn brightly. But, that, but, but for that light to burn brightly, it means you must consume us. So God, come. Overwhelm us. Remove the wicked thing from us. And guide us. Lord, we're praying today. We're praying for the ministries we're hoping are opening up soon. We're praying for opportunities that you will give us. We've just got two months until Easter when we celebrate your resurrection. So God, we're praying that we'll be able to reach out to friends and neighbors and proclaim to them that Jesus Christ is risen. We've only got about five months until vacation Bible school and so many young people and families in this community need to know you as Savior. So Lord, use us. Help the virus to be gone so that many children can come and have a free time and a good time learning about their Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We're praying for those families in August we'll be ministering to in first blessing. And also how you're going to use us. That by stepping out on faith, we're going to discover you're going to do things with us and through us we never dreamed possible. God, use this church. Let every member know how vitally important we are to your kingdom. Use us, Lord. Work through us and flow through us. No longer let this be a spectator sport, Lord, but put us on that playing field and help us to see we have a role, a place in this body. Lord, don't let us wait to be asked. Open my eyes to the opportunity right there in front of me to serve you. God, as we pray for these things, we pray that we do it all in a way that your name is lifted up that your name is glorified because you told us, Lord Jesus, that if you are lifted up, you will draw all men to yourself. God, help us do that. Let that be the goal of our church every day, every week, is wherever we're at as a church, each member serving, reaching out, representing you, lifting you up so that people can see you. Lord God, we're praying for this in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Many times uh, trials are brought into our lives to teach us things. And, and sometimes we gotta gotta sit back and, and look at what we're we need to be taught. Sometimes it's t- for us to get on our knees and pray. Um, but through it all, uh, we need to, to be at peace with what God is doing with us. Uh, sometimes it's not always easy. 
There's times when it's painful. But it is always well when it is God that's in control. And in that we can find peace. It is well with my soul. and stand for our offertory him. And uh, once again, if you haven't dropped your offering or your communication cards in the offering plates, feel free to do during this time to do that uh, as we sing my tribute.
God, we praise you, O Lord, for all, your, all the blessings that you have given us, for the love that you have shown us. So many people are just looking for happiness, Lord, and looking for things in this earth to give them happiness. And they just keep on searching, Lord. And the truth is, only happiness can truly be found in you, in your love and in sharing that love, Lord. And as we learn to, to share your love and serve others, we find a happiness that just bubbles up and overflows. And I thank you, Lord, for the love that you show us. So much so that you sent your son, Lord, to die on a cross for our sins so that we can stand before you, Lord, purified and holy in your sight. And the love that that shows is just sometimes so hard to comprehend, Lord. And yet you give it so freely. And I just want to take this time, Lord, to just to thank you for all that you've done for us. And I thank you for this opportunity, Lord, to, to give back to you. Some with our, our tithes and offerings, others with our time. And just, I pray, Lord, that all those who are searching may find you and finally realize the joy that can be had. And I ask, Lord, that you continue to, to guide our paths. And forgive us, Lord, when we sin against you. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right. It is good to be with you again this morning. Let's open our Bibles to the Old Testament book of Job. The Old Testament book called Job, J-O-B. And uh, he's probably about in the middle of your Old Testament. If you find the book of Psalms, he's right before the book of Psalms. And uh, we're continuing our series uh, this week and next week. We'll finish it up on 2021. Let's try this again. That uh, 2020 was so messed up, we're trying to get a new start. But as you're seeing, 2021 hadn't been a whole lot better so far. Um, some things are not going as quick and smooth as we would like, especially that vaccine distribution. And uh, many other things may not be meeting what we were hoping would happen this year so far. Nonetheless, we've got to hold on to our Lord. We've got to get our hearts right with Him and our heads uh, back into the Word. And as He works with us and through us, that, that we could overcome all the challenges facing us in this coming year. Today's message is going to be uh, entitled, The Struggles from Behind the Scenes. What do we mean by this? Well, you got a glimpse of it in your Bible reading this morning. And so we're going to be in Job chapter 2. Um, very similar scene to what you just read in Job chapter 1 earlier this morning. Job chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. Would you stand, please, for the reading of God's Word? Job chapter 2, we'll be reading verses 1 through 10. Again, there was a day when the sons of God to present, came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. And still he holds fast to his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. 
So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin. Yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself, and he sat in the midst of the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. Let's pray. Thank you, God for reminding us that there are people who have it worse than we do and they made it through and thank you for opening up the curtain letting us get a glimpse of what goes on behind the scenes Lord that this is a lot bigger than just us these struggles we go through isn't about punishing us or blessing us it is in fact about the glory due to your name and whether we will continue to give it so God open our eyes open our hearts and allow us to worship you. We say these things in the name of the Father, Son, and Spirit. Amen. Thank you. And you can be seated. Yeah, wouldn't you like to know what God is thinking sometimes? And why He allows or causes any of these things to happen? Several years ago, um, my family and I, we were uh, vacation with some family over in the Houston area. And we went to church with them. And it was the weekend when, if you remember, that big tsunami, that big tidal wave hit Japan and wiped out that nuclear power plant. And the pastor at the beginning of the message just said to everybody, I want you to know God did not do that tidal wave. God had nothing to do with it. Okay, we could all say. But at the same time, why didn't God stop it? Questions like that rage inside of us sometimes of why does God allow? Why does it happen? Is the devil as strong as God? Well, the fact of the matter is, as you look at something like the tsunami that hit Japan, maybe God didn't directly make it happen, but he allowed it to happen. Yes, he could have stopped it. And next week, hopefully, we'll try and address the issue of why he didn't. But that you might come to know and that we might all come to know what is going on when these kind of big things happen. Maybe it's good to remember the story of Job. Job is a, 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 the story of a man who feared God, as we've read, and he hated evil. In other words, he tried to be the best child of God he possibly could. He had kids, he had a wife, he had riches, he was well off. And then the sweet scene switches to heaven. And here where it gets a little bit mysterious for us. There comes a day, both in uh, verse 6 of chapter 1 and um, verse 1 of chapter 2, where the sons of God, and by sons of God they mean the angels, the sons of God came to present themselves before God, and, uh, and Satan was among them. So here's what's happening is, the angels have to come and they kind of kind of tell God what they've been up to lately. Not just the angels, not just Michael and Gabriel and all the pretty ones with their wings and their halos and all that stuff. But also, here comes the devil himself. Isn't that odd? As we will get into in a moment, it is important for you and I to remember the devil is not independent of God. He thinks he is. But when God calls, he's got to come. Isn't that interesting? So here is the devil among them all. Now we know the devil has an attitude about him because when it's time to give an account, God mentions to the devil, hey, you're out there tempting people, trying to get them to mess up. You're doing your best to ruin my world. Have you noticed my servant Job? And the devil says, well, yeah, you got a hedge about him, so I can't even mess with him. You got uh, him protected. But you know what? If you let me just for a few moments take away what he's got, he'll curse you to, his, to your face. The Lord allows Satan to take away. In chapter 1, Job's children are all killed. In, cha in chapter 1, his, his cattle, everything is taken away from him. Everything good, all the things, the people, the relationships, just him and his wife are left. At the end of chapter 1, when it's all said and done, 
Um, Job says in verse 21, Naked came I from my mother's womb, naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This man, having lost everything, still hangs on to his God. So the next time in chapter 2, when the angels have to come and present themselves before God, here comes Satan again and God says, Yeah, there you did. You took away everything Job had and look, he didn't fall by the wayside. He didn't give up in his faith. He didn't curse me to my face. And Satan says, well, yeah, but, but let me hurt him. You didn't let me hurt him last time. I just took away. Let me hurt him this time. And God says, I'm going to let you hurt him, but you can't kill him. And so Satan does that. And Job gets, if you can imagine, boils, pussy wounds from the soles of his feet, it says, to the crown of his head. The misery of that. Uh, of all of that up to the point where the dogs are coming and licking him because he can't even stop him. You know, it's, a, it's an awful situation. Job is a guy, a man who lived and who suffered more than most of us can even imagine. The loss of his children, the loss of his income, the loss of his properties, his, his, his cattle, everything he had to make money off of, everything he had to make a living. God allowed the devil to take it away. And you and I wonder... Why is he allowing that to happen? Today as we look at this, hopefully we'll understand a few things. Number one I want you to understand is spiritual battles are constant. This battle over Job was not so much about whether we hurt Job or make him happy. This battle was about would Job curse God? Would Job turn from God? Would Job turn on God? Would Job resist him and become rebellious toward him? That's what the devil wanted to do. Spiritual battles like this are going on all the time over you and over me. Struggles, good things, bad things, temptations, tribulations, setbacks, blessings, all those things, maybe by taking everything away, maybe by giving us too much, can the devil get you or me to turn our back on God? These battles go on regularly. And it might be a bit mysterious, and I have very little explanation about why Satan is up there in heaven before God, except that God called and he had to come. But in these battles that go on, while Satan sets himself up as the enemy, as you look at this passage, this is another place we as God's people can take some comfort. Well, that's what the devil's doing. He sent this virus. He's, do, he's cost me my job. He caused these riots. He's got this guy elected or that gal elected or whatever. The devil's done all of this. Yet anything the devil did, we're going to notice, he didn't do on his own. God could have stopped him at any point in time, anywhere along there. But these spiritual battles, they constantly come up because Satan longs to drive us and push us and force us into distrust, defy, and demean God. By distrust, he just wants you to think God is not good. God does not have your best interests at heart. God is cruel. God would not save or love someone like you, else why would he let this happen? To defy, to push us to the point where because God this, this, did this to me, I'm going to do this. I have no reason to submit myself to him. I have no reason to obey him. Why? Because God does not give me good things. In Job's case, he took away my kids. He took away my living. He took away my health to demean God. To call him ugly names. To lower it down and make him think he's somebody like us that owes us something. That because I've been faithful, God ought to bless me. He owes me. We have an entire movement. When I was a young Christian, um, I was trying to get as much of the word as I could. And I flipped on the TV and there is what I now know are one of those health and wealth preachers on TV. And uh, the guy was sitting there saying, yeah, Job said the Lord gives, the Lord takes away, but don't you worry about God taking away from you because the Lord rebuked Job and told him he was wrong. That's not correct. The Lord takes away, and when he takes away, God works. Sometimes he allows the devil to take away, and the devil wants to get you to think of God as a Santa Claus, that if Santa Claus isn't going to deliver, then that's all He is. He is nothing to you now. To demean God, for you and I to curse His name. 
Isn't that what the devil says? You take away what he's got and he will curse your name. In fact, look at chapter 2, verse 9. Job's wife, you know, she lost her kids too. She had the rug yanked out of her world. All her cattle, how's she going to make food for her family to eat? What's left of her family? And she says to him, do you still hold fast to your integrity? This is the kind of stuff the devil wants you to say. Why am I hanging on to my faith? Why am I hanging on to, to doing the right thing? Just curse God and die. That's where the devil wants to get you and me. To distrust, defy, demean him, to give up. When God says, take a look at my child over there. Look how well he is. Look how faithful he is. He loves me and he hates what you do. He loves good and he hates evil. And then the devil says, well, let me add him. Just let me, let me, let me just get a little bit, get a piece of him and see what happens. Wow. We worry so much about what the devil can do. But understand, Satan has limits to his power. He might be powerful, stronger than you or me, we think. But let's notice, man, he's limited in some ways. He's limited because, you know, first off, look, as we've said several times this message, when God called, verse chapter 1, verse 6, a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Chapter 2, verse 1, a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present him, himself. See, he has to obey God every once in a while. He has to admit in a limited way. I'm sure in Satan mind, mind, Satan's mind, when he comes before the Lord, it's because, well, I wanted to be here to make fun of you, God, when the simple fact is God called and he had to come. Satan is still rebellious, defiant. He has fallen. There is not an ink of repentance in him. But when God called, he had to come. When Satan complained about how good Job was, and the reason was because you're protecting him. See, Satan could not get past the protection of God. He could not steal Job's salvation. He could not break through the, the wall God had built up. He had to ask God to take that wall down. When you feel the devil coming on top of you, when you feel the temptations, the trials, the pressures, when you feel that evil working against you, rest assured God is allowing it. And we're going to talk about that. Why he might be doing that here in a couple seconds. But Satan did not have the power to just go in there. And, and here's the other thing. Satan says, and let, let's look back at chapter, um, uh, chapter 1. And let's look at verse 11 of chapter 1. Satan says to God, But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has. And he will surely curse you to your face. In other words, let everything be gone from Job and he'll curse you to your face, Lord. He says the same thing basically in chapter 2, verse 5. Stretch out your hand now, touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. See, another limit of Satan's power here, it's not just he's asking God to get out of the way. Satan doesn't know what the future holds. Why does Satan do the things he does if he knows God's going to, you know, book of Revelation is going to play out like it is? I think there's two answers to that. One, I don't think he truly knows what the future holds. Number two, when he reads the Bible, he is so defiant towards God, he denies any of this is going to take place. As one guy says, Satan lives in denial all the time. That there's no way he's ever going to beat God, but he keeps trying anyway. But Satan does not know the future because as it says at the end of our scripture reading this morning, down there in chapter 2 verse 10, the very last phrase of, the la of verse 10, it says, In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. He never did curse God. Satan figured, you take it away, that's what will happen. Satan figured, this, this is what will happen. Satan was wrong, wasn't he? He can't tell the future. He is not omniscient, all-knowing. He might be clever. He might be tricky. He might be 
catch you once in a while, but let's face it, he is not near the Lord. His power is limited. That means the stuff that's happening right now does not need to defeat you. It does not need to ruin you. It does not need to cast you down. You can still stand tall in the name of the Lord. You can still act boldly in His name. No matter what rights they try and take away from you, no matter what circumstances face you, Satan is limited in his power. Our God is far greater. Our God is far more powerful. Our God held this man up that when everything that could go wrong possibly went wrong, even though you and I, we can, we can, uh, we can understand, man, Job, I could see if you just got really angry and just cussed up a storm. But when it's all said and done, chapter 2, verse 10, in all this, Job did not sin with his lips. God then may not be causing, but he will allow. God says to Satan, have you seen my servant Job? And Satan says, let me add him. Sometimes when you're doing good spiritually and you've done nothing absolutely wrong, that's when it hits. You thought you were making progress. You know, you got your stimulus check, you got your tax refund. Oh man, look at all this extra money in the bank now. And then wham, that transmission just starts leaking all over the driveway. Yeah, God knew you needed that money. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away, right? Just like that. It seems like as soon as we get ahead, there's two steps dragging us back. God may not cause, but he will allow. God says, behold my servant. I am going to allow you to put my servant through this so that we can all learn something about my servants and about my power in them. God may not cause the virus. God may not cause your job loss. But he does allow it. Why? Suffering illuminates the character. That's inside of us. When God says, behold my servant Job. You know what? Job's been living this way for a while. He's been studying the word of God. He's been worshiping God. He's been walking with God. He's been obeying God all his life. Something bad has happened. He's learned God can be trusted. Something bad happens. He's learned God has not left him. He's been learning all his life that God will see him through everything. And now the darkest, most ugly thing has ever happened in his life. The loss of his children, the loss of his business, the loss of his health. But he knows God is out there. The Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. God brings good. Shall we not accept good from God? Shall we not also accept adversity when things happen? You may not like it, but every once in a while, God wants us to realize where we're at in life. The only way that could happen is pretty much for you to suffer loss, for you to suffer indignation, for you to be humbled, for you to be broken, for you to have your heart shattered. You wonder, why did this have to happen to us? God reveals the character He's building in us and you become not only a testimony of your own strength but a testimony of what God is doing in your life to other people. They are watching and they need to know that even when your child is dying of a terminal illness, even when you have suffered the loss of everything, that somehow God still carries His children through. Amen. Character gets revealed, illuminated through the suffering through the struggles we go through. Job's a pretty long book. And let's face it. My very favorite chapters of Job are chapters 1 and 2. And then starting about 38 where God starts telling Job how it is. Man, there's a whole lot in between. Job has three friends that come along to tell him, Well, we think this is why you're suffering. You did something wrong. Or we think this is why you're suffering. Is life is random and you're just a victim of circumstances. Or we think this is what's wrong with you, Job. You got some secret in your life that you won't confess. And they hammer him and hammer him with all of this. And really all of them were just wrong. Sometimes God does this not out of pleasure, not because he's cruel. But look at this next point. God has confidence in his children. 
God says this about Job. Go ahead and touch him. Let's see what happens. Remember how we said Satan doesn't know the future because he said he'll curse you? Well, God did know the future. God did know how his child would react. God does know how you will react. God does know what will this will do to you and with you and in you and all these things that come your way. Now, it may seem a little bit harsh to you and I. Why, what is God doing here? God wants to show the world that his children are in fact superior. By superior, I mean with Christ in us, we overcome. We're not better than them, but because the Holy Spirit dwells inside you and me, we are more than we ever dreamed possible. God is not afraid to put you through hell in this life. Because He has and He will. God is not afraid to take away that which you love the most. You who have lost children, you who have lost parents, you who have lost that which was so dear to you, and you sit there and go, why God, why? God says, I know you're going to make it through this. There's some things only suffering can build. There's some things in your life that the only way to grow your love and your compassion for others is to find out what loss really is. As a young pastor, I mean, I was pretty young and I had hair and all that kind of stuff. And it was dark brown, if you can believe it. And uh, uh, I kind of figured I knew everything about pastoring and how to be a good pastor and all that stuff. And, and you know, I was proud of the fact that, man, at funerals, I could just do a funeral and not feel anything. And then, then my eight-year-old nephew died and I never saw a funeral the same after that. God will break your heart of your pride. God will break your heart of your coldness. God will shatter it so that you understand what it means to be a mortal human being with flaws and failures in your life. We sometimes bemoan the fact we look out there and we see these famous megachurch pastors who are getting caught in adultery, caught in financial scams, and they're falling and their churches are being ruined. But it's a lesson for the rest of us to realize you are frail and flawed and you better admit that before you put yourself up there as somebody special. But God has confidence even as you have crashed and burned on the ground. He can build us back up. He has confidence in His children to go through corona, to go through riots, to go through bad government, to go through oppressive regimes, to go through good times and prosperous times, to go through picnics and births of new children, to go and, and find restoration of all these things. God, He can see us through all of it. Because in the background, he is demonstrating to the devil and the rest of the universe, this is a child that I have redeemed. This is the difference I make in their life. They suffer hunger. They suffer want. They suffer deprivation. But God is not afraid that you will go by the wayside. Why? Because he never let go of you. As we read and we get to the end of the book, Job gets his cattle and the things restored. Job gets healed. He gets back more than he ever lost. That's a good thing. But the important thing is that through all the struggle, God showed the world and everything in existence, including the angels and the demons and everyone else, that he is enough for his children. So you and I then need to respond like Job. How can we do that? Struggles come. And really, in the back of my mind, I think it's a little bit unfair that God just decided to use me to prove his point to the devil. We ought to take that as a badge of honor that God puts us through these things because God is showing his confidence on us. So what did Job do? Let's look at chapter 1, verse 20. Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head. Job had just found out that all his children had died. All his cattle were lost. Job had just found out he lost every earthly possession that was important to him. So he rose, tore his robe, shaved his head. These are signs of grief. And then he fell to the ground 
and worshiped. Ooh. You want to respond like Job? Worship the Lord when you've lost everything. Dale did a really good job with that Blessed Be the Lord song. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You know, through suffering, through the good things, through the bad, that is such an important concept for all of us to grab onto. That God is to be worshipped through the good and the bad. If I accept the good things, I want to praise His name. When I get the bad things, I need to praise His name then too. For some reason or other, He brought that my way so that I could find out that His power in me is more than enough. It may not bring everything back, but it will get us through. And that's what we've been talking about. All this thing of, of, of trying this over again. Let's get it back in our heads. No matter what the government throws our way, no matter what circumstances come after us, we will worship the Lord through it all. Don't let masks and other things like that stop that. Doesn't matter what rules they pass against you. Worship Him. The devil came after Job. And he worshiped the Lord. Second thing Job did that we can see very clearly is he submitted to God's lordship. Verse 21, naked. I came from my mother's womb. That means I came into this world with nothing. And naked I shall return there. I'll leave it with nothing. The Lord gave. The Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. This is a great statement to realize that God is Lord. He is in charge. He is sovereign king. He gives and he takes away and I need to accept that. It's part of my thing of worship but I'm also submitting to him. I will obey through the good and the bad. I will do my best to hold on to what I'm supposed to do. When Job and his wife use that word integrity, why do you continue to hold on to your integrity? Integrity is a simple word that means do the right thing when no one's looking. You know, on the outside it looked like God had abandoned Job. So she's saying, why do you hold on to your integrity of doing the right thing? Curse God and let's just die. But because he had submitted to God's lordship. Because he said he is my king. Wherever I go, wherever he leads, I will go. It must be a difficult thing when you're a soldier, a sailor, a marine, when you're, you're under the orders of another and it's a suicide mission. It's going straight into the mouth of the enemy. But you know what? So many of our brothers and sisters have done that. They paid a high price to buy your freedom. They accepted the authority of those over them. That that authority, the United States of America, had a higher goal than just keeping them alive in that moment. In the same way, God's kingdom may have higher purposes than just keeping you healthy and happy. God's kingdom may have higher purposes, so I submit to that lordship. Man, it costs me 10% of my income to tithe. It costs me time to attend church. I could have had this weekend off. But we submit to his lordship because we know there's a bigger picture out there and we're playing a role in it. There's a spiritual battle going on constantly. There's the devil saying, you know, Lord, just, just let me get him away from you for a couple weekends and you'll see who falls by the wayside. I will submit to the Lord's Lordship even when I can't come to church. I will watch it online. I will watch it on the DVD at home. I will still follow my God and my Savior. We submit. That's how we respond like Job. And we also got to accept his mysterious ways. By mysterious ways, I mean nobody can actually perfectly answer every question that Job in this book raises. Why is the devil allowed to get that close to God? Why didn't God just smash him like an ant right there when he's got him right in front of him? Why hasn't God already gotten rid of Satan? Why is God allowing this evil and that evil to happen and happen to me? Job says in verse chapter 2 verse 10, Shall we indeed accept good from God and shall we not accept adversity? Because God sends both. He allows both. We like to say if you'll obey, you'll get good things. And generally that's how life works. Sometimes when you obey, your entire world falls apart. Integrity is obeying anyway when that happens. Accepting his mysterious ways means that, you know God, I really don't know where you're going with this. How many of y'all have been there for that? I really don't know what you're trying to do. 
You know, we always like to say the way that God builds patience in us is to give us tribulation, right? How many of y'all got all the patience you need right now and really don't want any more, right? You've had about enough patience and you, you've really got, I couldn't hold another ounce of it. Have absolutely no use for it either. But in these things, we understand God is going to do stuff that we don't understand. And we don't get why the outcome has to be this way. And we don't get why good people got together and prayed for a certain outcome. And that's not what happened. But in all these things, we know He's good. In all these things, we know He loves us. In all these things, we know He's somehow going to bring us out and bring us through this. So blessed is His name. The good and the bad. He could stop them, but He doesn't. He could make it all come to an end, but He doesn't. He puts us through trial and tribulation. He puts us through hard times. And He blesses us immensely. And in all of that, we know one thing as we read the Word of God, that ultimately... God has for each one of us to become like His Son, Jesus. And if there's one thing Jesus is associated with, it is suffering. In Timothy, it tells us if we suffer with Him, we shall reign with Him. This stuff that God puts you through to build in us character we never knew we could have, to build strength, to do things, to make us a witness, and most of all, to cause the universe to stand back and wonder, Look at what God does with His redeemed children. Is that you? Maybe for the first time you're realizing that some of the stuff that happens to you, it's God trying to work in you. Allow that. Worship Him anyway. Submit to Him in those areas of your life. And accept the fact that He's going to do ways a lot different than you figured He would. But as we go through it, remember, this all means that Jesus Christ won us the ultimate victory. The way Job and you and me all can rejoice in this is because we know ultimately because Jesus Christ rose from the grave, there is victory for every one of us. The devil goes down. Death has been defeated. The power of Satan, the power of hell has no power over you. He tries to tell you he does. Today you can realize that victory by knowing, look, man, I just saw a glimpse behind the scenes. Satan, you got to come when God calls. you got to ask permission to do some of the things you want to do. And even then, he's still got to get something out of the way. You're not as big and bad as you thought you were, as you've got me believing you are. Resist the devil, and he will flee. Christian, that's for you. Maybe you're someone that's ready to start believing. Have you realized that this is what it means to be a believer in Jesus Christ. That the Holy Spirit living in you gives you victory over the devil in all these circumstances as you go through them. Not that you're going around them, but God carrying you through. Today, if you give your heart to Jesus Christ, if you say to Him, Yes, Lord, I believe from the depths of inside of me that you died upon that cross for my sin, you rose from the grave on the third day, believing that, and saying to him, I, don't wanna, I want to leave my old life behind and follow you, Jesus. Believing that you died and rose for me. In that moment, you become his child. As many as received him, he gave the power to become the children of God. Let's pray. If you want to receive him, now is the time. When we're done praying, we're going to sing a song while we're singing. If you're ready to take a step, if you want me to pray with you or something, come and tell me about it, all right? Let's bow our heads. Our Father in heaven, we love you. We thank you. And it's so good to know. We really are not overmatched. Since you are for us, nobody can be against us. The devil thinks he can have us. The devil tries to convince us that he's much more powerful than he is. But Lord, you are, you are far stronger. You have authority with your power. And he has to ask you permission. God, we bow down before you saying, we will no longer give the devil permission. We will submit to you. We give our hearts to you, Jesus, and say to you, rule over us. Tell us what to do. Tell us how to react and respond. 
And if there's anyone here, Lord, who's never done it, that today could be the day they're realizing they can simply say to you right now, Lord Jesus, I believe your death on that cross, your rising from that grave, is this truly where it all comes from? I want to leave my old life behind. I'm tired of how it's dragged me down, and today I want to start new with you, Jesus. And believing right here, right now, Lord, let them know, give them confidence that they truly become one of your children in this moment. Give them courage to step forward and share it with us. We pray for those, Lord, that are struggling right now. We pray you will watch over them. Anyone that feels the need to become part of Travis, Lord, we ask that you'll lead them to take the step to come down. And we say all these things in the name of Christ. Amen. So we're going to sing, and maybe you feel like Travis is the place God would have you, and you've been praying about it. You want to come down here and let me pray with you and present you to the church by transfer of letter or statement. We can do that. If you're someone that today you feel right now, I am finally taking the step I've been meaning to stay, take, that I called upon Jesus this morning, and I really feel like He's changing me right now. Come down here and let me share that with everyone so we can pray for you in your newfound faith. So let's all stand and we're going to sing. And if you're ready, while we're singing, come down and let me pray with you. Thank you all so much for joining us this morning. You who are here physically and those of you who are joining us uh, on the internet, we're so grateful for every one of you praying that God blesses you every step of the way. Um, we'll have a one of this Thursday night. And uh, please remember, we're going to start the prayer meeting back up next Thursday, the 11th. Don't forget that you have your uh, offering statements out there in the mailboxes in the foyer. And please take care of that. Um, Sam Moser, would you come and dismiss us in prayer, please, sir? Y'all pray with me. Dear Father, we thank you for allowing us to come into your house this morning and worship you with our brothers and sisters. We pray that you'll bless each one this, today. And Father, we ask you to go with us now and be with us throughout this coming week. Bring us back this next week into your house once again, dear Father. And we thank you in Jesus' precious holy name. Amen.